Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to the show. Once again, we have a very, very special guest today. Uh, we were just talking before we went live on camera. Derek and I hadn't, haven't actually talked in 15 years, but we've communicated via the, the, the web uh, numerous times. But welcome back to Sea of Tranquility, although now on the YouTube channel. Derek Shulman, lead vocalist, multi-instrumentalist, songwriter, record executive of Gentle Giant, Derek Shulman. Welcome to Sea Tranquility once again, my friend. How are you? Thank you, Peter. I'm doing okay, thank you. Considering uh, we're still under lockdown in Manhattan, and uh, you know, as, as we were saying, my hair is becoming like yours, and, and uh, in fact, I may just continue it to 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 uh, outdo you at some point. But okay, yeah. fine. I, I, I have fond memories of seeing you with the long mane back in what, oh. like 1972 or so, right? I mean, oh, yeah. the mane was very long, and the beard was very long, and, and uh, you know, the uh, the memory was very long ago as well. <laughs> So uh, a lot going on in the Gentle Giant camp, I guess. Uh, I, I always like to kind of touch base with some of these uh, great musicians of some of our favorite bands, especially when a notable release comes out. So back in was a late 2019, last quarter 2019, you guys released uh, the Unburied Treasures box, Correct. which yeah. for the you know loyal Gentle Giant fan, another treasure tr treasure chest of goodies right so i figured uh what better time to have you on the show to talk about the box set hopefully you got a copy to show us and uh you know talk a little bit about you know why do does a gentle giant fan need to have this uh and, uh, and we'll go through some of the what's included in this box i think most people if you don't already have it you're going to want to get one but uh so derek wait uh, you got a copy let's take a look at this thing so well, yes i do in fact uh, hold on a second please it's heavy as well <laughs> weight lifter to, uh, to do this Look at that. With the front oh. and inside, uh, if I can oh, open it. Well, this, it's heavy. And, and heavy means heavy for many reasons. Um, <laughs> I, you have a, this was uh, the official live album. You know, I, I, took, I took it out and didn't put it back together again. Anyway, this is the official live um, piece that was inside the uh, live album. You get a book, which is... Um, Look at that. All about the group and then the very, there's all these various illustrations and stories about the band. Um, so, so technically, could that be like the first ever like official book on Gentle Giant? I know there, there are a couple out there, but. Yeah, no, I think so. There's a jigsaw puzzle with various um, uh, knickknacks, uh, posters, and, and, uh, and the, one, the one book that I enjoyed a lot was this one, which is the tour schedule of the, the band from day one until until <laughs> D-Day uh, or, or the E-Day, so which is a you know, very interesting. And then of course, um, behind here, uh, oh, oh, Jigsaw puzzle is coming apart, sorry. Um, here is or are the albums which were cut from the original masters, as well as 16 live albums, um, which, um, which uh, were either, um, Taken from board mixes or, um, excuse me. Oh, I've, hold on a second, please. As you can see, everybody, there's a lot in that box. <laughs> I've got a <laughs> piece right here. Uh, yeah, you don't want to be missing the piece now, right? <laughs> no, there's two pieces missing now. God almighty, this is not fair. Uh, okay, let's put it back. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of stuff in the box. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm enjoying, I, mean, I enjoy, in fact, how it looks and how it came out. And um, in fact, um, to tell you the truth, I haven't even gone through the live things myself yet. Um, but there's about 16 or 17 live um, pieces in there from 1970 to 1980. Um, so it's, and you know, and, and there's the, the, and there's a, five point, a couple of 5.1 mixes to Steve, uh, Steve Wilson. Yep. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, it's a, I think it's a beautiful set actually. It's very, very well done. I would like to take credit, or we should like to take credit for it. But in fact, it was um, a guy called Ian Crockett at Snapper Records. He came to us um, in 2018, the beginning of. And said, so, "Why don't you guys?" Okay, because the catalog belongs to the band. Um, so we figured, okay, let's 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 let them work on it. And um, you know, who's going to buy it? You know, do you want to do a hundred or two hundred? And he said, no, I'm sure we can sell a little more than that. And in fact, um, we, uh, it's only a limited, a limited amount. Uh, and that was very important to us, um, 3,000. And they sold out. 
So who knows? That's a testament <laughs> to the fans, right? It's because, you know, I, I think with, you know, there have been over the last, what, 15 years or so, there have been various like box sets and special release things that have come out, you know, scraping the barrel and so on and so forth. And I think a lot of fans were probably thinking, you know, maybe that's going to be it. Uh, and then this comes out and obviously it's not it. So I guess my question is, is this going to be the last kind of big treasure trove of goodies from the gentle giant, uh, camp or is or could there be others? Well, there, there, when, when we all scoured our various, um, uh, memories, boxes of things that we had in our, in our, uh, collections, there were several other, uh, live, uh, out live, I guess, bootlegs, if you like. Um, and, um, and we may or may not put them out on vinyl or, 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 or whatever, but you know, nothing as of yet. I mean, nothing is going to be done this year. I mean, this year is a wash anyway, yeah. for, for lots of people and lots of reasons, um, which we won't get into. Um, but, um, yeah, we may well put out some other live, uh, material. Obviously there's no more recorded material. I mean, this is, this is, uh, Steve Wilson, in fact, has, um, uh, has done, we'll, we'll, we'll put out the, the, um, the next, the next three albums that Steve actually has done too, as remix to, um, which is interview, um, freehand and, um, whoa, not, uh, hold on one second, missing piece, okay. missing piece. We'll probably put that out next year, you know, those out next year, 5.1 with the graphics and the visuals and everything else. Uh, Steve is a good friend, as you, I'm sure you know, yeah. and, and um, Ray and him would work together on other things. Uh, but really there's, apart from the vinyl, which we just put out um, of the first four albums, um, which has not been, have not been in, 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 uh, in production for decades. Um, I, you know, I don't really see that much of what we could do. I mean, what we don't want to do and what, what I'd rather not see and us do is just continue to put out the same thing for a cash grab. We don't need that. We don't want that to happen. We want our fans to remain our fans and understand that we're not, you know, begging them to rebuy things that they already have. It's that short sure. that sure. we're enjoying. So for the box set, so Stephen Wilson remixed the first album, the self-titled debut, correct, on, on the box set? Yes, he did. Yeah. Uh, is, are there any plans for him to do acquiring the taste? Possibly, um, okay. but we don't. Un well, possibly, but unfortunately, we don't have all of the um, the, the album. Uh, yeah, on on, on uh, I think it was sixteen track. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was twenty four. Um, that was the reason why we did um, the um, oh three piece suite because we only found these. Lie, you know, the, the uh, multi-tracks of the first three albums, um, we ultimately found the first album in, in, in uh, complete form after that was put together. Um, but the other two, they're long gone. I mean, you know, and, and there's one album in particular, I would love to have Steve have a go at and, and us do redo it well in a glass house with the shirt that you're wearing, of course. Uh, we've looked and, and, and begged and asked for these, these multis to be found. And if anyone is watching you and any, anyone's watching us, please let us know where they are because we cannot <laughs> find them anywhere. And we would love to have that done in the way that we would like to, have, like to have done it back in the day. That was done in a very strange way, in a strange manner, and a strange time in the band's history. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I think most fans would probably love to hear Stephen work his magic within a glass house and probably three friends as well. I mean, I two of my favorite albums by the yeah. band. Yeah, well, actually, in a glass house, that was the first one. In fact, when Stephen, you know, got, we got to know each other, he said, I would just love to do, do that one first. And that's the only one we don't have an alt multi tribe <laughs> or any kind. I mean, that and and we've looked and and, and begged and, and asked, and no one seems to know. So, if any of your friends and fans and followers out there can, uh, can let us know they. Uh, please let us know because we would love to have Steven have a go at it. It would be great. So everybody who's watching, put your feelers out. If you know anybody in the industry who might have an idea where those original masters are, because uh, we would love to hear that. So, uh, all right. So on to the live stuff that's on the box set. So a treasure trove of live releases. And I know personally, I have a 
bunch of Channel Giant uh, official and maybe not so official CD releases over the years from various venues and dates and what have you. So, but everything that's in the box set, that's all fairly newly released, right? So those have not been available previously or, or I thought some might have been available in some form or another. Yes, yeah, some, some were, but some were not for sure. Um, these, you know, some were really kind of um, either, well, yeah, cassettes <laughs> or, or um, uh, tapes that were done from the board you know, uh, that were kind of kept by our roadie or, or Ga Gary, who is a very, um, he's an archivist um, in his study somewhere in, in uh, near Chicago. And uh, so some were not um, heard, some were. Um, and I, let me just get the, uh, the live albums themselves and let me see uh, myself here, if you don't mind. Um, not at all. <laughs> um, so the, these are the... It's uh, a nice little stack right there. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, so the, the, you know I haven't even opened this one, so excuse me while I uh, make a mess of myself here. This is this is almost like a true unboxing video. Got to love it. Fire and taste, power and glory, missing piece. Okay, this is in Essen, nineteen seventy-two. Oh wow, that's an oldie. Okay. I don't think that was no, that wasn't cool. that was uh, with Phil, and when well, Phil was in the band, of course. Wow, that was Jethro Tull. Um, 1973, Torino, we were headlining there, okay. Um, Cleveland, I think this was actually put out. Um, somebody bootlegged it and uh, these are the, okay, so this is Basel, 1975. Um, this one is a very, very good one because this was a rehearsal, Pinewood Studios in London. Uh -huh. um, and that, that was on multi-track, so it's, it's actually a well, well recorded a live album, if you like. Um, hold on one second. Let me just get this little track here. Uh, I'm, I'm boring, I'm you know, sure. Okay, here's the first album. Mm -hmm. um, the one we talked about here. Yes, indeed. Um, playing the Fool, which was the um, the uh, little package that we saw that was in that package. And here's Gentle Giant in Paris. Okay. Uh, let me get this next pack here. This is an unboxing, by the way. As you totally, said. yeah. Uh, three friends with the original album artwork. Gotta love it. Oh yeah, uh, freehand. Um, giant for a day. Oh, don't boo. Stop. Stop. It was. It was <laughs> um, look, let us. We were, we, we had to try things. Yep. Um, the uh, new. Oh, this is a good. This is a, a one which is a very the BBC sessions and uh, and New Orleans, which was a very kind of rare rare thing because there was a couple of songs on there which never came out. This was in uh, Vicenza, 1973, uh, Munster, 1974. Mm. And these two, this is quite interesting because for the live album, playing the full live, we, did, we recorded three shows. Uh, and we put them all together, Paris, Dusseldorf and Brussels. We took the two, uh, Dusseldorf and Brussels, um, uh, recorded albums and put them onto this double live piece. So oh, that's nice. the light, and this is on oh, Chester, England, with a picture of me by Shaw Perry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, if I'm boring everyone, please. You know, uh, no, the people we'll came to see this. That's that's great. Oh, quite all right, Derek. Okay, uh, Octopus with Roger Dean's cover. I've got to have that. Uh, interview. Which is, I, I kind of like that. I'm, I'm fine. This, 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 this album is, is quite controversial. There's a lot of people think, ah, awful. I like this album. I, I agree with you. Yep. Um, I think that we put this one out. This is a King's College 1971. Um, almost, you know, and that was a live album. And we, we, uh, um, we signed it as well. Uh, the Hollywood Bowl show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, was a. Uh, a good, a good red flag in the in the ground for us. St. Gowan's <laughs> Saloon. Uh, that was we're headlining there. Munich, nineteen seventy six. And what I think this is the second to last show we ever played at the Roxy in mm -hmm. LA. And of course, the Blu-ray of. And that's all you're gonna get. <laughs> That's a good amount. 
That's a good amount. Yeah, the jigsaw puzzle and, and, and the mask and everything else. That's right. You got the giant for the day mask as well in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come on. Here we go. There you go. Yeah, that is that quite is a set. So you said, so additional copies are being printed. Is that, is that how it's working or? No. no well, well, initially it was 2,000. We just pull these back and put them on here. Um, initially it was 2,000. And as I said, bizarrely, for me anyway, um, they were sold out before they even shipped. Um, and we toed and froed with uh, Ian and Snapper Records, which um, I, I distributed the, these, uh, these box sets. And it's, we didn't want to appear like, well, we didn't want any more. We said they were limited. That was it. But we didn't want fans who really wanted them to be paying you know, X amount over the eBay or whatever and, and not be able to get what what this meant to them yeah. so we decided to um to uh to produce 1000 more and that was it i said no more you know this is it if 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 there's a if there are people who are wanting this they'll do that and and apparently they sold out within a period of time so that that's it this there's no more going to be uh, produced i have a spare one here so <laughs> that could be a could be a a contest for you. It, my, my iPad, which I'm spit, sitting at, there's one spare one I have here. And there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you, Peter Parlo, the, the, uh, the you, can, you can say, anyone who wants to do a competition, um, in fact, here is one, it's sitting on one, which is an unboxed one. Look at that. That's a beauty. You can win this. You wanna put it, you, you wanna do a competition? I, I could certainly do one. Let's have to figure it's it good. out. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll talk. Anyway. Off, we'll talk offline about this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, so I, I have two here. So that now one is all, all over the place. I have to repackage it. <laughs> and I did a search on the internet uh, yesterday, so you can still find these out there. Uh, there are some folks selling them. They're you know probably maybe a little pricier than they than they were when uh, it originally went on sale. But uh, as you can see, a definite box of gentle giant goodies there. So, um, so I wanted to, I have a few questions kind of deviating from the box set a little bit, but, uh, you know, we talked, we talked about civilian and how, you know, you were pretty happy with that album. I like that album. I think, uh, I guess my question around civilian. So civilian released right as, you know, eighties are starting music's changing. A lot of kind of the prog rock veteran bands are either falling by the wayside or trying to figure out, how to reinvent themselves moving into a new decade where music is changing daily and rapidly. Some bands were able to do that. Uh, you know, Yes and Genesis and Rush were able to kind of change their sound a little bit, make it a little more accessible for the changing, you know, musical tastes out there. I think you guys did that as well with the Civilian album, but what happened? The, the band didn't make it, was, was the 10 years enough and you guys were just kind of burnt out like kind of what happened if you could take us back to roughly 1980 or so to the civilian days to the last tour and you know, what happened to the band at that point in time well i you know towards the end um as you said there was a whole groundswell a ground shift of of um the music business i mean punk had come in and had, had rattled the whole business um which which is good i mean in some respects it's important for people and 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 change to happen. However, you know, um, where we ra we were a little rattled as well. I mean, to be honest with you. Um, however, um, we tried to to continue to be ourselves. But again, progressive music means to progress. So to change and do things which are unexpected. And if you listen to all of our albums, they're I mean, they're not the same album as the uh, album prior to what we did. I mean, they're different kinds of albums whether it's the first one or, or uh, the missing piece or in a glass house or whatever. So civilian certainly was um, an, uh, uh, an album which we did. Uh, we, were, we did it in LA actually. It was the first one we did in, 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 um, in U the USA. We produced it in Los Angeles. The band came over. I was living in LA at that time. Um, and um, what we wanted to do was streamline our sound. Um, to, but at least keep what we had um, as far as musicianship, which I think we did. And, um, but I think that the fans had kind of like 
the fans that, that were fans of the stuff that we had done prior to A Giant for a Day, if you like, um, uh, thought that we should continue in the same vein and same mode. You know, a musician and a person that creates can, cannot create the same damn thing all the time. Then you're, then you're kind of like almost regurgitating the same thing. And, and progression means to progress. Uh, and, you know, whether it's Genesis or Yes progressed to a copier thing, you know, that was it. I don't think, to tell you the truth, we were able to. Uh, I think we tried, you know, with, with Jai for a Day, which, look, I mean, it's, it's for itself is not a bad album, but it didn't work in, in lots of ways. But it was civilian for me. I think, personally, I, I know a lot of fans don't like it. It worked for that time. And there's a song called Inside Out. I think it's, it's one of the best songs, if you like, that the band has done. You know, and I thought I'll take us all the way back to uh, Acquired a Taste and, and Gentle Giant. It was, it's, 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 it's got a ton of atmosphere, even though it's an 4 4. Okay, we're not changing time signatures, we're not changing, uh, you know, we're not contrapuntal, etc. But it's got a ton of um, atmosphere and a ton of, um, oh, how can I put this? Uh, it's it, sonically and, and musically, I think it's one of the best songs we've ever produced. But that's my opinion. But that, again, I mean, there's other albums that, that are good. But you're asking about, was it a time? I think that, um, I think that there's a time when the creative juices run out. And either you go on to something that is more um, in line with what is going on at the time, if you want to remain uh, relevant, which I guess, yes, and Genesis did, or just say, look, we're we're not we're not the band to do that. We can't do it. We're not we're not you know civilian and boom pop music if you like or pop oriented progressive music. Um, we tried. We couldn't do it. So we said, let's stop now while while we can while we still have fans out there and not try to sort of be a band that we're not. So effectively, that's what happened. Um, and then you know even touring, um, it became even though we, we, we certainly put everything into what we did all the time. Uh, but the last tour really felt like it was a job rather than, boy, we can't wait to get out there and, and enjoy ourselves, we, which we always did on stage and hope, hopefully our fans will enjoy it. It felt like, oh, here we go again. And when you feel those things, no matter what job you're in, whether it's your job or anyone else's job, when it feels and I hate, you know, listen, every, everyone has to make a living, but when it's a living you don't have to do, and it's a chore, then it's time to reflect on it and say, mm, is this worth it? That's absolutely true. And like you said, that works in all forms of life and all careers and jobs, no matter what, if it, it's, it's feeling forced, you have to rethink things and reassess, right? And that's, yes. that's what you did. So to- it's funny how uh, you mentioned that with the changing musical climate, you know, you guys made the decision, you know, maybe this just isn't for us anymore to kind of move into those kind of directions. But it's interesting, if you were to go back about 11 years or so before then, Simon Dupree and the Big Sound and Gentle Giant don't sound anything alike. So you went from this kind of like poppy, psychedelic R&B sound to that first Gentle Giant album and yeah. You, most people, if they, if, if I were to play, if, if there are folks out there who are somewhat familiar with Gentle Giant, but never heard Simon Dupree, and I were to play them a handful of songs from Simon Dupree, they would never think that it was partially some of the same guys from the same band. So, so how did you guys make the transition from Simon Dupree to Gentle Giant back well, in 16, you know, 68, 69, 70? Like how, how was that trend? How did that work? Well, that worked in, in the way that, uh, straight, I mean, this is, this is history that most of your fans would even, I mean, their grandparents would, <laughs> wouldn't even remember. Um, we, I, we, I started uh, Simon Dupree and the Big Sound while I was at school, grammar school, and Ray was in technical school. And it was like schoolboys, and, and this is the mid-60s in England. And during the, that period of time, there was an incredible creative atmosphere in, in, in the UK. It was, it was superb. I mean, you can't relive it. You can't even describe how um, amazing that period of time was creatively. You could say only sort of a, 
uh, um, a very sort of nascent uh, business. Um, so I put together a group of my own school friends and um, we started playing in our local area in Portsmouth, England. And we started going to other towns outside while we were at school. Um, we became very popular. We were playing, we were listening to uh, American R&B basically first. That was our love, R&B, jazz, uh, and, and classical actually. Because my father, our father was a, a professional jazz musician actually who loved, um, who loved classical music, but everybody, he, he had led a, uh, um, a jazz dance band. Uh, so music was also around. So we started that band and became fairly popular in the region and became, went up to London. Um, and we, have, we were lucky enough to get a contract with EMI. Um, and those stories are, are, are amazing. We had to go up to EMI Records and the band, this is Simon Dupree itself, and sit and literally go on stage and play our full set of uh, an hour and a half in front of the um, staff producers, including you know George Martin, David Paramore, Nori Paramore, I mean, uh, Sir so and so and so and so, I can't remember who was running the, the company at that time, play the full set. And either they gave you a deal or they didn't. Well, we were lucky enough to say, have, uh, I think it was, uh, it wasn't George, it was David Nori Paramore saying, okay, well, let's give them a deal. The deal was one single, um, <laughs> which is, you know, in those days, wow, we have a record deal. Yeah. Uh, and um, anyway, so I'm, I'm making this short story long. We did our first uh, single, which was a cover of the song called I See the Light, which is a very uh, important song in our repertoire at that time. It, it, it hit the sort of lower ends of the top 40. So we were able to make another single, uh, which was, uh, which actually it was mediumly successful. Our third or fourth single was a song called Kites, which was a huge success. It was a top 10, number one uh, single. And that was a pop single, which we didn't really want to record. It was written by somebody else. Our manager forced us to do it, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, probably fortunately, because of what it did was um, put us into a situation where we were, we were certainly headliners, uh, but get a little more money and a little, a little more exposure. However, what happened was it became a millstone around our creative mix. So we were kind of bagged into this world where we were playing shows where Dave D, Dozy McIntyre were playing and or the Tremolos or, or, or these other pop bands. And we were struggling to, to we didn't want to be, uh, it's called a scampi and chips circuit, where, where people were eating scampi and chips while the next pop band came on. And that really frustrated me in particular and, and my, my brothers and, and the guys in the band. And honestly, it was a time when we, were, we grew progressively uh, unsettled with this millstone around our necks, and also musically as well. And at that same time, there was a feeling in the community, the musical community, that was a lot more than pop music to, to, to explore. Um, Crimson, who came from the same area, uh, were called the League of Gentlemen. We were doing the same circuit. Uh, you know, there were, Man for Man were, it came from the same, all these bands were doing things. We were all, and we were hearing things from all these other places. One of the most important, um, uh, influences, if you like, was um, we had a keyboard player who came in as a dep for our keyboard player who was sick called Elton John. Well, his name was Reg Dwight. Right. And Reg was actually, in certain respects, comparatively instrumental in, 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 in pushing me and my brother Ray and Phil, actually, to wake up and, and do something different because he said, look, you guys are great. I and mean, you should consider, you know, if you want, if you're really that bored with with um, going out there and playing to the championship circuit, listen to bands like Spirit in, in California, which we did. And they were a huge influence, by the way, to many of the British progressive bands. I don't know if you know that. No, that's good. That's interesting. Oh, uh, if you listen great to- Great band though. Great, great band, great riffs. We did, and, and Reg, we gave we friends after he decided to be Elton John, which we said would never work. Um, anyway, uh, we did, and we said, I, honestly, I, I really had enough. And in fact, there was a, an emotional problem where I said, I can't do this anymore. It was me. I said, like, I'm not doing this anymore. And so we were lucky enough to have a, a manager um, who we said, we're not going to continue. We're not, we don't want to continue with Simon Dupree and the Big Sound. This 
it's stymieing our creativity, it's stymieing our, our uh, personal lives. And if this is it, then it's over. He said, well, I, we want, I, want, I would love to continue with you. What do you want to do? We said, we don't know. We want to put a new band together. And we literally had, we were lucky enough to have him fund us putting this thing, which, which we had no clue what it would be. But we knew we wanted to do something completely different to where we were because it was a, the pop circuit was, was really very frustrating to us. Um, and we had about six or nine months of finding the right players. And we found, thankfully, the first uh, player we found who was on our page, if you like, was Kerry, yep. who just graduated from the Royal Academy of Music. And then Gary Green, uh, who came in. Um, and suddenly we found ourselves in a situation where we, we had great musicians who came from different areas and different worlds around the Shaw Brothers, if you like, to make a sound which eventually became Gentle Giant. It was a very sort of interesting period where anything and everything went. Uh, and then we put together with Tony Visconti um, our first album, um, which is a combo of everything and anything. Um, and it was a fantastic period. It really was. It was so creative. We were in the studio with Tony. Next door was a queen at Trident. You know, and, and, uh, and uh, we were doing, and before we, we went in, T, you know, a T Rex were doing their session. And, and Bowie was outside waiting for his session with Tony. Um, somebody was asking me, um, who did the, uh, the first cover of, uh, of this? Um, and it was, uh, you probably know it, but it was a, a gentleman called George Underwood. Uh, George was Tony was uh, David Bowie's best friend from school, and he was uh, uh, he came into the studio, and Tony said you should meet George. He should do the the uh, the cover, and anyway, so that I mean I'm making the long story very the short story very long for you here. So that was the, the uh, that was the um, the birth of a realization. I mean, those are some absolutely great stories, and I think that's what people want to hear. And um, I think. You know, what you said about you have all these different musicians coming together from different back musical backgrounds. And I think that's what made the music of Gentle Giants so eclectic, so different and so beloved. And I, I guess my next question is, you guys have some of the most loyal fans that I've ever come across. And again, we're talking about a 10 year period. So it's not like a really long, uh, you know, number of years, but you packed a lot of really influential, beloved music into that time period. How, how does it feel to you and the rest of the band to know that you have this fan base out there that will, they'll purchase anything you put out, anything from the archives. They are very um, steadfast in their opinions on the records, on the music. And still to this day, and you and I talked about this 15 years ago, whenever discussions come up about classic bands that they'd love to see reunite, it's, it's almost always you guys at the top of the list in you know, the realm of progressive rock. So what do you attest to this just love and loyalty from the fans about your music? I mean, it's just, is it because the band was so unique and so hard to categorize and so honest and did what they wanted to do, did what you guys wanted to do? Is, do, you, what, how do you? What do you attest to this just extreme loyalty and love from the fans, like towards Gentle Giant, which I don't see for a lot of other bands? Well, I, I think you just said it, actually. I think what we were, uh, um, and what, what we were, um, was um, we, were, we, we were not commercial. We were, we were a London band. We were, you know, if that makes any sense to you, we weren't in a, in a scene, per se. We were down in, we lived in, in, in the, in the uh, southern part of the uh, UK, for the most part, and we were cocooned. And um, we, re Phil, actually, in, in his own... Um, uh, ironic way said it on the second album in, in the uh, I can't remember how it, how it was said but basically in the sort of uh, way that we we present our music popularity is not the, the first concern it was mu musicality and really we were in some respects very selfish because we thought of ourselves first and wanting to be better for ourselves musically pushing ourselves to an, a limit for ourselves personally and then recording that and then putting it on stage next. And hopefully fans and friends would enjoy it. If it didn't, then we wouldn't be, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be 10 years. It would have been a year or not. But thankfully what we put together and what we took on stage and what we recorded 
was pretty selfish, actually, um, because it was for us. We weren't. We but weren't it worked. Kidding. Apparently, and, that, and I think in that respect, it was it was um, uh, it was very um, self indulgent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, yeah, but it was it was unique. I think, and I think it's, it was. It, it had, and I think that the fact is that when we try to be a little more, in quotes, I hate quoting myself, but quotes, commercial, which we did, to tell you the truth, on Jive for a Day and some parts of Missing Peace, um, it didn't work. Uh, and we acknowledge it, but if we didn't try it, then we wouldn't know. Um, but we weren't a commercial band. Right. We were just a band that enjoyed playing for ourselves and hopefully if an audience enjoyed that too, to an audience that would enjoy the music itself. Sure. And that's why I think there's some kind of a, a legacy, if you like, yep. that we didn't try to be something we weren't. I, I will throw out there that I think the one album in the middle of your catalog that is very accessible in a different sort of way and is usually the album that I recommend to folks who have never heard Gentle Giant before, and that's Freehand. I think there's a lot of material on freehand that is very catchy, has a lot of great hooks. It's very challenging from a musical perspective, but there's something about that album that I think is very appealing um, from a more commercial aspect, even though, like I said, the music, the arrangements aren't necessarily, uh, you know, pop music, so to speak. Right. But um, so looking back on the catalog, which album is number one in your heart and mind? If you had to pick your favorite recording of, of the catalog, which, okay. which would it be? Um, the Power of the Glory. Really? Um, yeah, because that was a time uh, when the band was really at the zenith of its um, playing wise. I think we, we had really uh, hit a stride and were mature as a band. Um, John came in, John Weathers, who was the, I mean, he was the glue actually when when he arrived you know, b b before we recorded Octopus uh, he was the glue that really drove the band in the direction of being a rock band I mean we're progressive surely we, but we were certainly pop and rock and R&B and, and, and progressive or whatever that means but he was the one that kept that backbeat going yeah. like, like n never before um, and we had you know we toured a great deal I mean if you look on the, the uh, box set you'll see the shows and we did we toured and toured and toured, um, and he was like a, a machine. And um, I think during that period of time, about '76, I think it was recorded. We were we were streamlined, and, and there was almost like a it was the easiest record to make. It, it was it came so naturally and so perfectly, as far as I remember. And even the uh, the lyrical content and the musical content all fitted into a situation where we were very at ease with it. So, you know, a lot of times when we recorded, there's always, there's always this, you know, we should do this, no, let's do that, no, you're wrong, and then, you know, and then there's a huff and a puff in the studios. But this one seemed to be very, it was almost like spreading butter on, on, a, on a piece of toast. It was, it was that smoothly done. And it came out like, I believe, for my years anyway, my thoughts, that it came out that way. I, I do agree with you uh, regarding Freehand. I think that's an album which has, the elements of, uh, you know, there's certainly, it's certainly a, a, one of my favorites too. Um, and it has elements of, uh, uh, using the word pop is stupid, but commercial appeal. Um, but it certainly retained what we were and, and what we are, um, but it rocked. And one thing that, that's one thing that the, that the fans and band and, and uh, anyone who listens to us should know that we were a rock band. You know, progressive is a, is a title that we never put on ourselves. We love to rock. We really did. And, you know, if yes. you saw us live, anyone saw, saw us live, saw us saw a rock band. I mean, we we were we were headbangers. Yeah, I, I once read a long time ago. We're talking about like in the in the nineties. I once read an article somewhere where they were talking about a lot of the classic seventies prog bands, and and the, whoever the author was said that Gentle Giant was probably the heaviest of the seventies British progressive rock bands. Yeah, we was were, like yeah, we, in spots you could be right. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. We, we, yeah, we were. We, we, we would have fitted in right alongside Pantera and uh, who I signed and and, uh, and and Slipknot and God knows what else. Yeah, I mean, this is we were a rock band 
and we were a rock, a rock band that played interesting music, I think. But yeah. but rock was again the title of it. Progressive is is kind of um, this uh, Chiron on the bottom. Um, we were just a band, that, and especially live, of course, we rocked, and I loved. It. You know, we we enjoyed playing and enjoying ourselves on stage and rocking out. And the one thing that we did. On, as a live band is, uh, we enjoyed it. We enjoyed ourselves. We didn't look down at our instruments and pretend we were, we were this, you know, um, semi-orchestral music musicians that took ourselves seriously. We took ourselves, we took ourselves uh, um, seriously personally, but we enjoyed, we, we, we love making fun of each other and having fun on stage and smiling to the audience rather than shoe staring. We, we enjoyed what we did and we, we wanted to see smiles on our fans' faces, not boredom and, and hands in their arms waiting for the next funny and interesting piece. So, it was so in saying that, how difficult was the infamous Black Sabbath show? <laughs> it, was, it was funny. I just uh, to reflect back on those times uh, because it, this, you know, we had the same management uh, and that, that was the interesting thing. We knew Sabbath very well. Uh, but and, and thankfully, that was our introduction, that tour was the introduction to North America. Um, but, um, oh, just, we, you know, we were, we were very, actually, we were very fortunate that during that tour, um, even though the fans that came out to see Sabbath ordinarily would boo us before we came on stage, um, but we were, we were, had enough chops and experience having been in Simon Dupree to woo them over to our side towards the end of the show. Uh, and at the end of the shows, whether it was in Chicago or, or Minneapolis or God knows where, we get some kind of cheering and, you know, a couple of people will say, get off, you suck, et cetera. But generally, it was a, a positive um, experience before Sabbath went on. Uh, at, at the, in the Hollywood Bowl, um, that was one where we, uh, we, were, we were really like lambasted uh, before we went on and we were fighting the, the audience. And getting you know, some cheers, but for the most part, who cares? Who get off? Uh, and then the cherry bomb uh, incident happened, which everyone I think know about. And um, and it was towards the end of the tour, and uh, that got myself and Phil, my brother, uh, got our backs up in a, in a major, major way. Um, I said, "Hey, you know, as we stop the band, um, <laughs> to stop a band in midstream, to an audience that's." Uh, to say how to say it, is is a little um, uh, aggressive towards you uh, was was another sort of uh, it's almost like these riots are going on right now yeah uh, so that was no that was a no no and then to my brother Phil I said hey you guys this is this is bullshit or something and then Phil took the uh, took the bull by the horns went up to the microphone and said hey you guys are a bunch of cunts excuse me uh, that didn't didn't bode well. <laughs> <laughs> so the audience, as a, as a, as a, as a twenty thousand uh, 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 explosion of negativity, was was hilarious on reflection. But boy, that did not go well. We finished the set, and we ran out of LA as quick as we could, <laughs> and didn't go back until a couple of years later, where we actually sold out for that seven or eight nights. I'm sure. Yeah, that's how the way it works, right? Yeah. As a lifelong Black Sabbath fan, I have seen many an opener booed off the stage. Black Sabbath fans are tough on openers. I mean, that's just, the, that's yeah. the way it is. It was, especially back in the day. Right. So but the, the funniest thing about that show, if you like, I mean, this is a, uh, you know, reflecting back God knows how many decades was that the Sabbath were going through their chemical romance yeah. I mean, in a major way. And, and, um, during their show, uh, Tony, um, <laughs> you bring me back to stories. Tony was imbibed a little too much and fell flat in his face. Uh, and his guitar was feeding back like hell. And the crowd were going apeshit, not knowing that Tony had passed out. And the feedback- well, part of the, It's all part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> and the feedback was like, that wasn't his, that was just because he was like, he was unconscious. Yeah. I mean, that show was, a, was pandemonium. And but we ran out of time so quickly and got on the plane back to England and said, boy, let's never do that again. <laughs> Certainly not like touring with Jethro Tull, right? So. <laughs> well, that's definitely yeah. Tull. Uh, we were, were very kind to us and took us out uh, again, thankfully. And that was our sort of uh, um, our reintroduction to, to an audience that enjoyed our music a little better. Yeah, exactly. 
So to kind of finish this out here, for, for those of you who don't know, so since the band, since Gentle Giant broke up, uh, Derek has had a very long and illustrious career uh, in the music industry, you know, working for Polygram Records, Atco, Roadrunner, and, and lots more. Uh, can you talk about, like, what's, what's your proudest moment post-Gentle Giant? Like, what's the, you know, I know you, you helped sign a lot of bands. What's your kind of proudest moment? Uh, and then maybe talk a little bit about what you've been doing lately before we finish up. You, you post uh, Gentle Giant? Yeah. Um, you, know, you talked before about signing Pantera. I know you worked at Sign yeah, Dream Theater. And know, a lot of let, me, let me just talk about Pantera. Because that one, I think there was, there's a lot of bands I've been involved in and lucky enough to have signed and, and, and run companies, etc. cetera. Um, but Pantera uh, is, is probably one of my um, most interesting, and, and I guess, I hope, whatever finest means, because... Um, it was a band that had built a following in Texas. And no one was in, I mean, at that time, the major companies weren't interested. I was running ATCO at the time. Um, and I'd heard about them when I was at Polygram. I was leaving Polygram to go to ATCO and running the company. Um, and we were intrigued by their following, kind of like Chettle Giant. They had this, this amazing following in the Southwest uh, there. Um, but they were heavy as hell. I mean, it didn't fit into anything it was on the radio at that time. It was, this is completely abstract uh, as far as what the music business was doing. Um, and I sent a scout down um, there to see them. Uh, and they were playing this 30 people, 30 person club. And during the time they, they, uh, they were playing, uh, my scout called me and said, you've got to come see this band. I, I know you, you sent me down here, come soon. So I went down to uh, Arlington, Texas uh, to see them in this club. Uh, you know, knowing that I had, you know, I was running a, a corporation, knowing how I had a, a staff to build. And I went down there and ha having been through what I've been through, if you like, and you being a musician and running companies and being involved in the business, um, after three songs, I was, I was absolutely entranced. I became a huge, I became a fan. And when someone who's as jaded as I am or was or am or whatever it is, becomes a fan, then you know you've got something. And you know, this is a small club, 45, 50 people, but Dimebag and, and, and the whole band just blew me away. And I knew that it would, they would never, never get on the radio with the music they had. They would never uh, be on MTV because those are, the, those are the, uh, the marketing tools, if you like, that you knew would help break a band quickly. But I knew that this band, if they blew me away as a jaded record executive, if you like, they would blow other people away if they got on the road. So I signed them. No one else, want, I, no, no, no other company was interested in this band. Um, but I knew what I had to do was instead of trying to, you know, put them in, out there with, with Black, or not Black Sabbath, with, uh, with, with um, on MTV or, or trying to make them, you know, uh, a pop uh, AOR band, have them be themselves, but put money behind their touring, knowing that when they played somewhere, they would get a fan base that six months or a year later would be 10 times more than they had going, go, you know, when they first started. So I'm, I think I'm most proud of that because I, I became a fan. And, and when, you know, I used to, to start to love something in the way that I did when I saw them, I just know in my heart and gut that that's going to work for everyone. So that's probably my, my proudest moment post Gentle Giant. I mean, there's other ones, of course, and there's some disappointments too, oh, of course, uh, where, yeah. where, where you think you had the same feeling, but other people didn't. Yep. So you know, having successes, there's also stiffs as well, we won't talk about. <laughs> I think Pantera is like a perfect example of a very good band who ha with label backing becomes the band they really wanted to be. Because if you, know, if you listen to those first few independent albums that they put out, they're really solid, but then all of a sudden Cowboys from Hell, right. It's like a different yeah. bands, like holy smokes! Yeah. It's like what happened here, right? Yeah. So uh, very cool. So what have you been up to uh, as of late? Well, I've been. Uh, <laughs> I've been well, besides yeah, besides we're all sitting at home, right? <laughs> See, look at that. Yeah, playing my guitar because we're under lockdown, of course, as you know, uh, in Manhattan uh, for the last three months. So um, taking walks to the park, but I I had um, overseen a couple of uh, companies, uh, one in Japan, just you know, just you know, just really um, and playing music for myself, as you see with my my headphone line from a fire, where is it? My little thoughts, AC30. <laughs> uh, and just doing things for myself. 
um, really just overseeing a couple of companies. But honestly, being in the trenches in today's market and knowing that the business itself is, is um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that, uh, that the gentle giant is still re reviewed and, and, and hopefully revered in some quarter. You're, you're, you're part of it. Because, um, again, having had this many, many decades of experience in this business, um, when I listen back to these things, you know, uh, I realize, it's funny, I realize what we had. And it still holds up. So yeah. I've been listening. I've been listening to the Gentle Giant as well, which you know I'd never, do, I'd ordinarily never do. I mean, you know, that was a chapter. You do it. You turn a page, turn a page, and you, you write a next chapter. And I'm rereading things, which is which effectively I'm doing the re-listing, re um, and um, realizing why there's still a fan base out there, and why there's a fan base that discovers the band, even though they were they weren't even born or their grandparents weren't even born at that time. So effectively that's what I've been doing for the last couple of months. Cool. No, no desire to maybe put together with the guys, a new gentle giant song. Um, you'll okay, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a little, uh, hint. There's going to be a song which will go up on the net, um, proclamation, um, where you'll see the band reform. Really? Wow, and other uh, and other players, uh, other players playing along to that song in particular. Um, Ray and Kerry and myself, Phil, uh, Mar Ma um, Malcolm Mortimer, Malcolm. Gary. My, you know, we're all in this. My brought my son. In fact, he works with he works with somebody. That's his job. He's got a lot of people, uh, and then we have, we have um, celebrities playing little bits and pieces of, of a proclamation. And that's going to go up on the web um, within a few weeks. And uh, so you, you'll see a quasi uh, um, virtual Gentle giant reunion. reunion. <laughs> the first time in 50 years, or 40 years. That's pretty cool. Wow. So we're, we're actually playing as well and, and, uh, and singing. So that's very it's, cool. It's a reunion after 40 years, virtually, for the 50. lockdown. 15 years ago, you told me, I never say never, but I don't think it's going to happen. So here we, here we are. Very cool. Oh, but, it, but it's virtual. Yes. Oh, still. Hey, hey we're, we're living okay. in a virtual world right now, Derek. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> That's why never say never is the right, the right thing to do. That's right. Very cool. Well, uh, I'm sure everybody is going to be waiting with bated breath for that. So a couple of weeks, you said, will be... Uh... Yeah, my son is still working on it. And Ray actually helped out as well. So we, we have a lot of other... You know, players uh, from Yes and ELO and and, uh, and she, you know, so that, you know, people are friends and fans as well as fans. We wanted yeah. the fans to play. And so we have a, a whole combo of different players playing over the music. So it's going to be, I haven't seen it. I've just seen myself do a verse. And you know, I'm, I'm actually in tune. So you know, <laughs> that's awesome. I can't wait to hear it and see it. So very cool. Well, Derek, thank you so much for being on the show here. This was a delightful conversation. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the box set, uh, you can still find some copies out there. Definitely, uh, like I said, all sorts of goodies in there. Look at that. It's just, it's huge. It's packed with stuff. Definitely something you'll want to own. And, uh, visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Thanks again to Derek Shulman. Uh, hope to talk to you again soon. We'll catch up with you on Facebook, my friend, and I'll let you know when this video is uh, live on the channel. And uh, everybody, see you all tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good rest of the weekend. Pleasure. See you later.